and we're live. Hello. I think we're live. Hi. The screen is always a surprise when we come back to this. Well, welcome to another AS edition of the Eventide live stream. We've gone straight to royalty today. We have one of the co-founders of Eventide because it takes two of us to gang up on our special guest today, George Massenberg. Uh, so thanks very much, both of you, for being here. I'm looking forward to this discussion because our desire is to talk about immersive audio, the myriad challenges associated with immersive audio. And, and the two of you have been critical for getting us into interesting stereo, really interesting surround. And so I want to step into what the heck can we do when we add height channels? So unless George corrects me, I think nominally what we're talking about is going to seven... Dot one, dot four. Of course, there are many immersive things, 22 channels and beyond, but let's let's think of at least the minimum of four height channels. Is that about where we should center the conversation? I, I think that's a good start. And by the way, Pro Tools is a little slow to catch up because they're still only at a bus width of 712. And we've been begging and pleading for a year now and seemingly without effect. So, uh, but what we want to start with is 714. Well, hopefully you're saying that now we'll get Pro Tools to, to correct that. Um, so, so I thought a good place to start would be to um, go back to a record that you've done where it was done in stereo and then you did it in surround. And how would you think about doing it uh, when you add height channels? So I thought we might start with the amazing sounding James Taylor live record that you did, which has beautiful live performances. They're all on the tightrope, no net. So you capture the performance, but it sounds like it was recorded in a studio. It's multi-track, super high fidelity, beautiful recordings. I think it sets the bar for live recording. I'd love to talk to you some other time about how you did it, but that was a very compelling 1993 stereo release. You did it in 5.1 and maybe you discovered some things. And what if Columbia Records came to you with a lot of money and said, we'd like you to mix it with height channels. Can you just tell us how you would begin to think about it? Well, I mean, it, it's a challenge just entering the orbit of that discussion because record labels, when they do exist, uh, don't come to us with fistfuls of money saying, mix this in immersive. The, we'll get into the dollars in a minute, but the bar is set rather low where UMG in their uh, business plan really hasn't allocated all that much money for remixing. They have a couple things that they ask. A rather um, a rather shallow staff of mixers uh, to accept for payment to do these remixes in immersive. And those of us who are being paid reasonably or working directly for artists. So it starts there that that uh, an artist wants to find you because they, for some reason, are interested in a great immersive experience on their terms, which is to say um, uh, artist priorities, artist intent is, is how we try to center our, our sensibility is what's the artist's intent? What is he or she trying to say? Along the way, are we getting close there? Whatever, and working with an artist to, to really do an immersive experience, which is the opposite of working with a company because I'm afraid that Dolby and UMG are a little bit more focused on selling this idea of immersive. And that means proving that something's happening and shit is moving around. It doesn't have to make lyrical sense or um, any sense, any sense at all. So, so that you think that when the company is involved, you're under pressure to demonstrate the technology, you got to put some wacky stuff up high, just so the la average consumer knows it's working. Well, and you have to put really wacky stuff up because it has to happen kind of right away. Like, uh, like uh, yellow brick road kind of happens early on. Uh, some of, there's some really great immersive mixes out there. Um, but the ones that are done on the production line where a gang of kids comes along and we're not kids, comes along and preps the stems and the tracks because that's a humongous part of the job is transitioning from 
a pop mixer's delivery, which is generally stems, stems only. Occasionally, you'll be able to go back and get tracks, and occasionally, you'll be able to get a new pop mixer, or more accurately, a new pop mixer staff to break out the stem so that you have the stem and the mix, the effects, and the delays and the reverbs on a second stem. So it's a, if you will, a four track stem. You don't want to call it quad, but you just have the effects broken out so you can fuck around with the effects. Because that's that's really effective. George, there there is no seven second delay on this live stream, so you'll. I'll, I'll be very careful, not not to offend the boss man. No, I'll, I'll be very careful. I'm not going to use that term that I used that I can't say, of course, because I've just said I won't use it. But <laughs> um, but if I slip, I, I I hope everybody forgives me. But going back to this idea of of, of what's working in the immersive space is what I was hoping we'd talk about for this reason, is that I believe it takes a new head and a new uh, set of experiments without being encumbered with old solutions. So it starts here. It starts with hoping we get better tracks, hoping we get 96K tracks instead of 441 tracks. 441 is difficult because as you know, you can't can't do Dolby in 441. It has to be 48, which stuff comes in, you bump it up to 48, and you've lost all of your naming and your session IDs right away. Um, so we're hoping to get better stuff in and then to be able to start with basically 5.1. I mean, we learned a lot in doing 5.1. Um, and it took a long time to come up with mixes because it was brand new. You know, theatrical didn't do 5 1 music. We had to kind of invent what goes in the rear, if you'll forgive the expression. Um, that, that this thing has to be studied and, and a and a visceral response either generated or not. And more often than not, it isn't. It's like, what the fuck is that? Or that doesn't make any sense. You know, more often than not, um, it's, I don't want to call it a mistake, but it's a blind alley. It was suggested that some things in 5.1, I'm going to talk about 5.1 for a sec, if you'll forgive me. Sure. Um, putting That's an drum, acceptable F word. Putting drums in the back was always a no-no. Well, fuck that. Uh, one of my favorite uh, multi-channel movies, Shaun of the Dead, if you've ever seen it, you should look at it again in 5.1 because the underscore is all in the back. These guys went exactly against the rules and did the underscore in the back. And it's brilliant. It's just That's brilliant. So, yeah. so for us, Elliot Shiner in particular, who is who I I defer to in just about any conversation and is one of my favorite mixers of choice of all time. Experimented with the center channel, experimented with uh, content in the back and uh, came up with some uh, pretty good ideas. So it starts there. It starts with, you got to try some things. That doesn't work in the record company production const construct or workflow is is uh, listening to something and improving it because it takes, in the case of, I think my best work, which was done in 5.1 with Joshua Judges Ruth, uh, there's stuff happening in the back all through it. And it was all experiment. And it took, I was booked for three days. I took two months <laughs> and, and I learned 5.1. And by the way, the mastering was a big, process um and 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 what we learned then is if you want to do something new uh, it, it, it's got to be new you, you you got to do it really new so so this is what i'm what i'd like to get back to with with uh what and to put so that's where we are for immersive is that we're at the experimental phase and, we are and 
you've got a high quality audience here tuned in. You're basically giving them inspiration that they should go experiment, see what well, works and what doesn't. I'm giving them inspiration that, that it, in this instance, they can't expect to be paid for it because it's not like a, uh, a factory producing widgets where you have an, an exact cost structure of stamping out widgets. It's not stamping out widgets. It's uh, investigating a better way to make one widget, the first widget. You, you know, Tony makes widgets. And and he and his first, he's got a couple widgets right behind. Look, 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 look behind Tony. He's got a 2016, and he had, <laughs> and the lid's open, and he has, admits it has to be. <laughs> he admits what we all knew, which is invariably. Uh, it, it, we had problems making it work. Now, now this was uh, to veer off into another room. Uh, this was a problem in 2016 because from day to day, you weren't sure you were getting the same thing that you had come up with yesterday. Maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. You know, the parameters, you have to give it a little, little bit right in the right spot, come back to life. In Tony's case, he had to raise the lid with an, so, a precision solder sucker. That's not just any tool. That's a precision solder sucker. So George, why did you bother? Why did you go through all this trouble? Because it's great reverb. Thank you. Great hey, reverb. can I ask you a real quick question? Yeah, yeah. Just going back, you said you want you need to have really great tracks. And I, I get the 44.1 is what's, it, you know, your judgment, the difference between 96 and 48, does it really matter? I think there, there are two things that are happening and, uh, and it's important to identify what we hear uh, uh, left brain and what we experience more long-term. So the immediate thing that you hear is you escape some of the problems of, of bad filtering, which is to say, escape some of the problems with digital filtering because at, at 44.1, you don't have a lot of room to work in. Filters have gotten better code has gotten yep. better. But um, I would also suggest that it's better just to get rid of all the issues and just go to 96k. I mean, come on, guys. There's a reason to go with 44.1 any, anymore. You know, since this discussion started 15 fucking years ago, it's been 15 and 15. 15 so, so it's at least been, been two to something, some rather large exponent, so at least two to the four, at least 32 times more disk space since you started griping about 96K taking up too much space. Get over it. It's Get not, the fuck it's, over it. It's not space, George. I'm greedy. I want every cycle. I want to process the crap out of stuff. And I, and I want to be able to do it in real time which means I need lots of cycles. You don't so need I get 48, 48 gives me twice as many instructions. No, 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 no. What do you mean, no? No, no, you don't need real time. You need real time for live oh, performance uh, and right. low latency. You don't well, need real time. And fair enough, we fair enough. Enormous I, capability. I need and, real time for what I'm doing, but fair enough. Okay, and I, I grant you, it may be crucial to your work, but for most recording workflows, you cut the tracks and you have a couple of processors just to help the artist perform. But you don't do the full, I mean, the last thing I did in Immersive was 160 tracks with stems and tracks from four different producers and, and two HDX cards, chock full, two HDX cards at, at 48K. I couldn't do it at 96K. So there's an argument there. That's the but, problem, yeah. yeah. But no, the problem is, is what we're listening to. The problem is what's improved I think I'm going to go way out on a limb right off the top is, is a lot of that shit that we put in there isn't really necessary. It's artifact by the time we get to the end of the process, putting this plug and this plug and this plug and this plug and this plug, five plug. Oh, okay. We have to go to a second set of inserts so we can get 10 fucking plugs on this, on this marimba track. No, on this, uh, this clave track that hits once in in 15 minutes and i don't get it i don't get it and i think that's that's the thing that you have to budget for that's the thing that you have to, but it shouldn't limit your thinking 
in where you go and separate. In fact, to be honest, the best things I hear from Morton Lindbergh at 2L Records are at 192 and 384. And, and a, okay. a stunning, stunning, stunning sonic experience. It's more the classical experience, more the live experience, Tony. And your point is well taken that we do have to budget. We have to right. juggle all these things. I'm just a greedy, greedy person. That's all. I'm simple. I want the well, cycles. For the and right you know, reason, because what that, means, what that means is, is you're going to program more tight, tight code. So that's important, too. That sounds like hard work. work. You love hard work. <laughs> I know this. <laughs> so, George, if all the other problems were solved, make a leap with me. Imagine the tracks are all, it's your project. You're in sync with your artist creatively. We are have one chance... mind. Okay, right. I'm there. Okay. Imagine. Okay. The budget is limitless. You're That's gonna not going to happen. No, 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 no. Let's skip right ahead to do some experiments. Okay. Let's do some experiments. See? So how how are you thinking about height channels? Would you put a full bandwidth source up there? Are you thinking of it as ambience cues? Are you doing decorrelated energy up high? How do you... How do you begin to think about all, what all the above, design. especially especially when when you're when you're tracking, is is you take some sources in the room. One of our PhDs uh, named Will Howie did a single acoustic bass in our large room, single acoustic bass, just performing. The curtains had come out, you know, the big room at at, at Schulich, big room, and uh, soundstage and serious reverb. And he did a single bass and recorded it in 22-2 uh, with the lower ring. And, um, and it is an absolutely stunning experience. And he did it at a fairly high rate, which may Except have only been 96. <laughs> it was great. So. Uh, uh, going back to that, I think that it's quite possible that, all depending on what your project is like, and I love working on multi-song projects where I can uh, have an arc of the development of a an artist. Where is the artist this, at this point in time? What is he or she thinking? What is as uh, as complicated as that is with a group like Bon Iver, and. Uh, and, 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 and the complexity that that brings early on, still it's something to consider is getting some sources live. Let's get some sources live. Uh, drums in a room, or, or if you can balance musicians in a space, which I would submit, we could do at Blackbird Studio C where they could all hear each other in one space. And then get a sense of, of that room sound. It gives you another color on your palette over here that you could maybe use later when you mix is, okay, for this particular tune, let's use this. And you would mic accordingly. So you're talking about not mix moves, but microphone placement to capture an immersive. Absolutely. And, and really it's four in the air, as long as you can do four in the air. It, it, if, if you want to go back for just a second to talk about remixing James live, we've got two... I think we got two sets of audience mics far and, and near. So we could space them out in some creative way. But, but to have uh, sources on your palette when you go to mix so that you can say to yourself, self, what if I put those mics in some weird place? But let's skip ahead to the other mixing choices. One thing is, is uh, alternate... Uh, things that come in at points in a song where you do want to grab somebody's attention and going to height is like we used to do going to surround. It's a great way to grab somebody's attention. And the last thing is uh, that, that you mentioned is uh, uh, decorrelated things, having something happening low and something happening high. And the best way to do that is uh, Delay, but here's where Tony chimes in. How are we going yeah. to correlate this shit? One way, by the way, we're still waiting for, is uh, micro subsample delays so that we can tune delays 
a little bit more effectively so we don't get a tone. Any delay in a loop has a tone. And it's it's right. a trap to use right. a delay and not consider the tone that comes off of a repeated a repeated delay. So what would help is to have uh, micro sample delays so that we can actually tune delays, especially delays with regen and have that happen in different spaces. That's very effective. So that the tone you're talking about tuning, that's just essentially the, the slight coloration of comb filtering and you'd like to move that exactly. by less than a sample. sample. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, for good so, reason, yeah. as you can get it in tune. Well, there are plugins that'll get that. that that'll there get are a few. You. There are a few. There's, yeah. There's one yeah. from Eventide called Precision mm -hmm. Delay. And and in fact, the way you do it is by upsampling inside. You upsample right. to four mm -hmm. x or eight x or whatever. Right. And that thing that you were talking about with with being greedy about cycles, <laughs> it uses a lot more cycles. I know. So, George, what is your how do you use maybe starting with stereo? How do you what is your patch for that creation of decorrelated energy? We we've all spoken about it. Of uh, you know, is there a that's a, a filter, really good a question. Shift a delay, and is that working for height channels as well? That's a really good question. But to decorrelate in stereo, well, it depends on the instrument. But it, but you're listening for the compromise between. Uh, decorrelating left, right, you know, spreading the image left, right. And by the way, one of the easiest ways you probably recommend is the two guitar mic thing where you put one mic far left and the other mic far right, you know, and two different technologies and they're just different and weird. It's different a crap mics. shoot. Right. Different mics and it's a crap <laughs> shoot. And you listen to it as you move them around. Yeah. And maybe put them out of phase. So that's one thing that I think that putting them out of phase, maybe putting them in phase, depending on or putting them sitting. back in phase. <laughs> in, phase. You know, in the case of drums, who the fuck knows? Um, but this idea of two things of the source and also the reverb, decorrelating, having good left-right decorrelation in your reverb. And then you can't take the same reverb and put it up top because it's correlated. Totally. So where do you start? You start with a delay. Does this do it enough? No. Okay. Well, then you go into the the, the, the parameters, the reverb, if, if, if you've got an all, all pass based reverb and you can get into the parameters, just fuck around with it. You don't need so much reverb to sound perfect anymore. You need it to decorrelate. So just you fucked with the, uh, the parameters in the uh, all passes. Uh, is a way to decorrelate bottom and top. Sometimes just EQ will do it. Just just boosting the high end will do it. But this is another thing, Tony, is how we decorrelate reverbs is invariably based on uh, something related to a seed, a random number of seed. And I wonder if we could have a user-selected decorrelation constant in a reverb. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's possible. I mean, the reverbs I've done you are, de you know, in effect, decorrelated in that way. I mean, I mean, I thought I think that's one of the things that appeal to you. You can hear that the left and right channels yeah. of these stereo reverbs are decorrelated. You know, I got yeah. I got I got yeah. lucky. I was at an, an AES in uh, in the UK. I think in the late seventies when I was thinking about this. After I finished working on pitch change, I thought I had done enough there. And um, ran into a, a brilliant man named Michael Ger uh, Gerson, you know, Ambisonics. Oh, and I had a side conversation with him about matrix al algebra and how you might be able to interconnect a bunch of delays and be stable. And it turned out to be something that was, that was called feedback delay networks. I didn't know it was called that at the time. But, um, you know, that, that cracked it open for me. But but I came up with what I, what I can't... I, Again, because I'm greedy and I was out of cycles and um, limitations forced me to think of something very clever to do with how I was injecting signal into those uh, feedback delay networks. And, and you came up with something, you came up with something I think is still brilliant, which is not disgusted, discussed, oh, did disgusted. I say disgusted? No. <laughs> yeah, of course, no. <laughs> is, is nested all passes. Which I did that. Some... I did. I did that. But you know, I, I think I, I created a couple of algorithms with that. But that's not what's at the heart of the reverb you love. 
nested all passes are wonderful, but they're really, really tri tricky. And yes, I did. I think I came up with that, but a lot I've of these. I've not seen it anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, this this shit is obvious. So speaking, you know, of it's, not, it's not. It, yeah. Speaking. Yeah, like, that, that was the one time I think I, I met the fellow. Speaking, of Michael Gerzon. I mean, this is one of the fundamental geniuses. Yeah, oh, of absolutely. Modern audio. And, and, and just keeps his, his ideas keep reverberating. And I work with Peter Craven. And as you know, he was partners with Michael yep. and, and some of those ideas uh, carry on. But one of the things was ambisonics mm -hmm. and B format. Mm -hmm. And now we're kind of coming back to that, you know, slouching back to that because one of the formats that's worth talking about is binaural. And, and the idea of, of doing a, you know what, I'm mixing my directions here. So I want to talk about these two independently. First, there's there's nothing necessarily wrong with ambisonics, except that we can't manipulate it as much as you might hear from a record company. Well, can you move this there? Can you move that there? No, you can't do anything. It's a live recording. But let's go back to immersive because some of the some of the most adamant, some of the uh, best work done has been in uh, binaural. First, just binaural stereo, and then and and now uh, binaural as a release format as something that does capture height. And it's a real challenge because it's, for the most part, a fake, and and that's a problem. The goal, the goal, George, would be primarily to make it possible for more people to hear immersive because all you need are earbuds. Right. Which is good ones. overwhelmingly, I mean, and, and, uh, and uh, Andres Mayo says it's a hundred times more popular. I think it's even greater than that, that earbuds are the preferred way of, uh, uh, of, of listening to music in, in a certain demographic. And we have to we have to observe that that home playback is not a, a rectangular room, a shoebox with reasonable treatment, big video screen, and uh, uh, eleven well placed speakers and a sub. It's just one out of not a hundred, but that room, that home theater immersive room, is one out of thousands. I'd, I'd venture to guess. It's a, it's a major investment and it's hard to get it right. Yeah. It's and, unlikely to be a consumer format. And, and yet at the same time, there, there are people listening in that format that say, this is the greatest thing ever. I never heard anything like it. Well, listening in this room, Blackbird C uh, is an existence defining moment. You've never heard anything like that and you want to hear it again. And you can't because recreating that room is too expensive. Mm -hmm. But it does give us hope for the limits of performance. And when we listen, we want to make it more like that. Let's let's have let's have this really this height thing really resonate. Well, why doesn't it resonate right now? Well, first because to get height to get that that uh, um, that effect that uses a generalized HRTF across the population, which is in itself ridiculous, but you have serious timbral shifts. So the first thing you do is you take what we mix for and really fuck it up. And that gives you the impression of it moving vertically. And I, I submit that that's not working very well. There's one major manufacturer that depends on that. And Nico Bolas and I are studying this independently and trying to figure out how to make this software work from this major, <clears throat> this major manufacturer, how to make this software work. Because it doesn't, it, it changes our mix. In, in Nico's case, it took uh, a track uh, from an artist he was working on, took a track and raised the, uh, high frequencies enough so that the artist heard noise. What's that yeah. noise that comes on? What the fuck is happening? Oh, so it's not timbre then. I thought you said it changes the timbre. It does change the timbre, but what it, the way it changes the timbre is to crank the high end. Oh. That mm -hmm. that constitutes a change, in, a major yeah. change in timbre. Sure. And so, that, 
the cranked high end is it's a HRTF Q for height for right. some of us some of the time, right? right. If it's right. shaped that right. way, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. So I, I I hope hey James, are we leaving the audience in in the dirt here? James. They, they've said nothing. I I George, I was a, a height skeptic at first because you know, the, our ears are on the side of our head, not the top and the bottom, at least for the three of us, it looks that way. Um, Only if you're vertical. But I realized that, if, that's an important point, uh, that you turn your head a few times. So let's not listen critically to music, but let's watch a really fun film that's in, in, in 714. Uh, you turn your head a few times and you can absolutely tell when stuff is above you and, and when stuff is below you. And it is pretty thrilling and pretty fun. So it can be effective, not as accurate maybe as we'd like it to be, but it can be theatrical. Well, we're turning to real life and and I I like real life. And by the way, to veer off, to careen off to the side, Tony, the best proverb I've ever heard has been the woods outside my house is what comes off of a billion, billion leaves and trees trees. and that beautiful density. Yep. Yep. And, um, so I, I walk in the mornings and, and, uh, and just listening to birds. And that thing that I love to do with critical listening is to try to identify bird calls. In, in, by position, in, in position, yeah. 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 That's tough. And, and yet it's a great exercise it's a, it's in critical listening. Critical listening, absolutely. By the way, there's another exercise in critical listening that I wanna to mention to our audience is the way most of us engineers learned about critical listening was you know, that that workbench that Tony has back there? Where's the soldering iron and the screwdriver? It sits to the left there. Yeah. So and and you know and you know so you're working away on something. Your mind's a, a little bit, and you and you drop a screw and it's a it's a 440. <laughs> and you, sh- you shake the chassis trying to figure out where it is in the box. And it falls out. And then what? Well, then what? It goes tink 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 okay. tink, tink tink. And my exercise in critical listening is identifying where that fell oh. and where it bounced yeah, yeah. and listening to the ting, 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 ting. And that's a good start for engineers it, geeks it, like us. You know, why, you know why humans are good at that, right? <laughs> no, 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 it's, I'm serious. Right away. Okay. No, because, because it gets dark. <laughs> I mean, in history, and right. you know, there's no moon, it's a really dark night. You drop something you really need. You drop your keys. You're a caveman. You drop. Well, the I'm keys a cave, caveman. Cave. You know, I'm your child. I don't know <laughs> something. You drop something. No, we have to. We have to be able to navigate through our world even when it's dark, and that's why wow, we're so good you, at lock, lock, localization. What you just went into is the imprint, is the biological imprint, the genetic memory of what we grow up, grow up listening to. That's what you just veered into. Mm-hmm. You want to pursue that, my friend. That's why you're on this call is genetic memory. Because I think that whole thing with the deep right brain experience of what we grew up listening to, just the sound in our bedroom as we bored out of our fucking skulls, try to figure out how to get out of doing homework tonight. Sound of the conversations of the adults in the other room as you're falling asleep. Or even even better, here's the Ed Sullivan show and he's talking about send the kids to, to, to bed and we sneak downstairs to see a video of the first atomic bomb test. Yeah, yeah. That thing, hearing, being able to, anyway, I'm really veering off. Uh, but that's, critical that's, that's why you didn't want me on this call. I just, uh, I'm, <laughs> that's I'm exactly why I wanted you on this call, my friend. This is this is great. So, so we must have what seven listeners, seven people counting counting us. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. Well, well if we're it, gonna it, leave it's, them, it's good to see you, George. I don't I don't really care. You know, this is we, a conversation we we between between right. us, Alex <laughs> and you and I. And this is great but alex let's let's try to return to something more relevant um, look I, wa- I have something i'd like to ask you so the the binaural and earbuds seems exciting at first the idea that many listeners will be in a very sweet sweet spot a pretty predictable sweet spot but i'm wondering if the lack of head tracking matters you know if you turn your head the entire sound field turns with you yeah. versus if you are actually in a space and you turn your head, that's part of how you interrogate the space cycle. And this is the difference between uh, actuality or uh, whatever that, that French word is, 
an actuality and a contrived presentation. And by I don't I don't see contrived as being a pejorative. Uh, contrived meaning it is built and it is a rock and roll tune that's built. Um, classic rock and roll tunes. You know, you can swing your head any way you want and still get you off. And uh, and so I think it's acceptable to say that that's all right without head tracking. By the way, the best multi-channel to binaural head tracking I ever heard and Ludwig and Elliot who dragged me into this room at the uh, CS show several years ago were the Smith brothers who had a uh, six to two had a center surround which I really miss in the Dolby setup I miss that center surround I you, want that speaker in back of me why do you miss that because it's my experience that the phantom center rear is pretty compelling if you're on the yeah. median plane. Not as compelling as when you mixed in DTS and 6.1 DTS, having something that's absolutely grounded in that center surround for the same reason that the difference between center surround and the center front and virtual front is so dramatically different, especially as you go off axis. If you want yeah. something really locked into that back, you're going to want that center surround speaker and a virtual center doesn't give it to you. But I was trying to go somewhere else with this, with the, uh, with the, uh, the Smith brothers box. And it was like a 10 MIPS box, Tony. It was nothing. Um, did custom HRTF. So, you know, you sat down and did six scans, uh, 30 degrees on X, 30 degrees, three in the back. And then they put a little mic inside the ear canal and did, did the ear. And they didn't do height, of course, back then. But that's the only, only 5-1 uh, reduction algorithms, well, in this case, 6-1, I've ever heard that was worth a shit. And the thing that, that I would draw everybody's attention to is that thing that we've learned in doing 5-1 and, and hearing the difference between phones and speakers is that voice in the center of your head shouldn't be in the center of your head. It should be in front of you. And to do it in front of you, you need, you need good HRTFs because that's subtle is, is what happens there. So uh, I, I don't think we're going to get anywhere until we have a scheme. And I've got a patentable idea that I've mentioned as I do in public. Because, you know, Tony, when you talk about things in public, especially patentable ideas, people think you're crazy and there's no way I'm going to waste time on that. That's a key because then you have leave to develop a patent. So it's even, better, I it's, even, it's even better when they know you're crazy. Yeah, and because they'll, <laughs> they'll stay away from even the hint that you're going in that direction. So I've got a patentable idea for HRTFs that I want to talk to you about. And I've tried to- Talk about it up. now. No one's here. Talk about it now. No, no, no. And my PhDs have ignored me and uh, they just haven't done it, except for Matt Borum. Matt Borum's done some pretty good work. All those kids these days. All those kids. Especially when to, to, they, to quote Aristotle, all those kids. <laughs> Nobody will get that. We don't have an audience to laugh along with us. Tony, Boy. Tony, have you have you noticed that uh, George says Tomber, not Tamber? What's up with that? Well, my brother John says Timber. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi to John. For <laughs> Uh, I forget who we were talking to the other, Steve Marcantonio. We were talking to Steve Marcantonio, who knew John from the old days. And I'm sure he'd say hello too. Boy, is that a non sequitur. <laughs> Let's go back to decorrelation. So the, why do you think decorrelation is interesting? Why does that help with loudspeaker illusions? Well, the first thing is, is uh, auditory tests of, of uh, listeners in, in auditoria uh, prefer left-right decorrelation. It's size. That's the size of the image. They, they don't want something coming right down the center. So that's well understood is, is acoustically um, in a classical context, a listener would prefer decorrelation. Why? Well, probably because it, it helps to decorrelate the source from the ambience. And I'm sure there's research on that. Somebody's going to be yelling at me when I get home. But, uh, but that idea that 
in a great hall, in a fucking great hall, like uh, Concercabel is my favorite hall in the world for this sense of this great sense of presence off the stage and a supporting ambience that's unlike any other room except maybe Berlin uh, that, that I can remember is it just imprints this 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 balance that uh, I can I can I can't escape is the, that's what it, that's the best it can possibly be so the, the you you get a spreading of the image and you get some spatial release from masking. You, you don't get much spreading of the image. I think that's oh. the key. You get the oh. direct image because you want to hear the performance. I mean, you get early reflections. Uh, but I think that, that, that it's more diffuse uh, for all the fucking statues and masonry and schmutz that they throw up on the wall. So, so you're not getting confused by, by early reflections. You're, you're hearing not the direct confused. sound and you're being immersed. Yeah. In a very pleasing way. At the way. same time. Yeah. yeah. And so the reason I raise it is, well, twofold. One is I'm, I just want to be sure that the other three listeners besides the three of us <laughs> know how that's done. So we're just sort of quickly alluding to it, but you can create the correlation with reverb, but what else? So what's the sort of, what's the patch? What do you put around a lead vocal that needs a little bit of decorrelation? Right off the top delay, a, a tune, tune delay. So right two unique delays left versus right. And what yeah. sort of delay times? These are short. Delays. Well, what we used to do, well, we didn't have much of a choice. It was just, just prime number. You, you do two prime numbers. Uh, and, and that kind of caught on, I'm, I'm pleased to say. Uh, but, but that still is, is uh, uh, atonal. And what we'd really like to do is to be able to choose the, the if there is a, a, a ringing artifact because uh, of comb filtering, we'd, we'd like to be able to choose it. But uh, but I'd say you start with delays. What do you do then? Well, what we do in 5.1, and, and this is this is very effective, is you take your, your vocal, and if anything needs a sweet spot uh, to be larger in a room, listening room, it's a vocal. So to make the sweet spot much bigger for a vocal, we'd bring the artist out into the room a little bit, which means uh, a, a mix between center and virtual, center speaker and virtual, or center speaker and an array of, of uh, side speakers, wides. You bring it out into the room, the source out into the room a little bit, and then you'd have a couple of delays back into the room, but you'd roll them off. You'd have a low pass and uh, so you don't get, get uh, obvious uh, de de delay artifact. You have a low pass and you just get warmth that brings the artist out in the room and you key in on, if, if you're listening outside of the sweet spot, you're keying in on the, um, the articulation of the artist in the center, but the size of it is, uh, is spread out a little bit. And so you'd use different delays going back. And I use, a, like I said on that panel with Clear Mountain, I use a fuck ton of delays. That's a technical expression. I use a fuck ton of delays and just keep adding them until, until it feels right. Back to what Al Schmidt says, somebody asked him, well, Al, how do you set up your EQ? He says, I don't fucking know. I turn knobs till it sounds right. That's, that's what you got to do. You got to turn knobs until something strikes you as being believable. But you're that putting... I'm sorry. In that example, where, where you're adding some delay to those rear speakers, are you also adding some some a little bit of reverberation? Yes. Some well, you've delay. got reverb. So so that's my soup is three, four, five delays, mm -hmm. and at least three reverberations, always including Princeton Eventide 2016. Always. That's a oh, pitch. You're, that's you're important. Always including because that, that's my go-to long delay. Short to short. Oh, excuse me. Long reverb. Short reverbs, it's invariably a 250 because, man, that was Barry Blesser. Yeah. I think. Oh, yeah. And uh, boy, you know, I, I wish I knew the algorithm because he really nailed short verbs. Yeah. That but, may uh, actually, that may, that sounds like it might be, might be nested, nested all passes. I don't know. I mean, I know Barry and we've had many conversations over the years, but we've never told each other what we were doing. <laughs> so. Well, I, it's something that at the end of a life, I want to go up to an artist and say, listen, 
for posterity. Would you just fucking tell us what you did? Now, we tried to do that with uh, Van Gelder, with Dr. Rudy Van Gelder. Right. You know, if anybody took an honorary too seriously, it was Dr. Rudy Van Gelder. Because uh, an honorary is an honorary. But, I mean, you shouldn't put <laughs> it on your return address. I, but, I don't. But for the, never will. for the 250, the, the only vocabulary then was all pass and, and some comb filters, right? Probably. I, I, I don't yeah. know. What, no yeah, furs. Don't know. That, no, no. no furs. It's 250, the 250 was being developed the same, at right, uh, coincidentally at the same time as in 2016. I went off a bit on a, a flight of fancy with the 2016. I decided to build a general purpose digital signal processor that could do things in addition to reverb. And that slowed me down a little. And you did. Yeah. You did. Well, it was stupid. It, you know, then DSP chips happened. I, you know, I built an array process. Of, out of well, you, you had bit slices. You had four, four bit That's, bit slices? No, no, six. 24 bits, just like a Motorola 24 bit DSP. That's, I, I, I needed 24 bits. You know, and a 64 bit accumulator. So, oh, no. It, yeah. That the, had a uh, lot the, to do with how good that thing that thing. Ab oh, was. absolutely. Well, I knew that. You know, yeah. the, the damn thing is, can never get the, these things to to work well. You, you could never get I, the chips to seat in the sockets because all of it. It's, Richard it's, wouldn't it's buy a, gold sockets. It's you a, could have it's bought a terribly gold shoddy design. It's it's embarrassing. <laughs> Isn't part of it the uh, the density of the <laughs> delays in the reverb and the and the rate at which it grows? It grows dense. It's well, different yeah, no, no, yeah, different from a that, plate. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's square one. There was a you know Bell Labs paper. Schroeder showed a parallel comb filters, and I actually that I I so again fortunate. I was fortunate to work at Eventide. We were building delays very early on. We had a recording studio, and delay lines back then had to be burned in for a week or two because. Uh, as Richard said, uh, ICs back in the day uh, suffered from infant mortality into their middle age, and so you know we'd be we'd be swapping out shift registers. But I had a stack of burning and delays. So nights and weekends, I could drag up a bunch of delays up to the studio, patch them into the console, and basically build the Schroeder algorithm and say and discover that it sounds like crap because the echo density builds up linearly, and yeah. that's totally unnatural. Unnatural. Yeah. So, so I had dinner with Manfred Schroeder, and and uh, when he gave the uh, he Kino. gave a uh, keynote, yeah, no a Heiser lecture. He gave a Heiser lecture, Heiser, that's and, right, or a keynote. But we took him out to dinner afterwards. I couldn't a get a word in edgewise, and I forget who was who was commandeering the table. But I wanted to talk to him. I had I had taken an idea. I talked about this before. Taken an idea from one of his early papers with uh, the, the early diffusers. He did QR surfaces, 2D QR surfaces. And his paper was basically built on 2D, 2D uh, quadratic residue diffusers. And so at the very back of the paper, there's a picture kind of in the corner of the AES preprint where uh, Manfred Schroeder says, and it's also possible to build a 3D surface. So I'm thinking, Perfect. <laughs> I'll build 3D surfaces. And this is in this is in the late 70s. And uh, I, I was one of the first ones to build a 3D QR surface. I, and I, I uh, thought you were. And there was that Peter person. There was somebody else, right? Who built yeah, it. he was the there Antonio. at this at this the at this meeting. And yeah. and of course he he took off with it. I mean yeah. and good for him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, man for just, is another one of those I, guys. I just, just want to be say to be fair to, to Manfred. Um, back, I and mean, this is for the audience, this is prehistory. So it was not possible to hear any of his algorithms in real time. It just was That's not, right. not possible. This was all pen and paper. Or, or a PDP-8. Yeah, but a PDP-8, just, you know, uh, uh, trying to get audio into a PDP-8, George? I, I did. I got, into, I got into a PDP-11 in grad school. And that, that, that yeah. basically I got my master's because I was able to get audio into a, a goddamn mini computer. So, a friend of mine did room simulation in PDP-11 later, where he did a source position and listener position. I did and ray it, tracing, it just, yeah. 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 So, so Schroeder's yeah, that, now workflow, we're talking about, yeah. Schroeder's workflow would be you, he tweak a parameter and then come back the next day and listen to it? I don't think he ever listened. I don't think he could have. I don't think he never could've. listened. I don't think he could have. Wow. I think he imagined it out of physical phenomena. Yeah. He he was a, a real fan of 
real physical, mathematical, physical phenomenon. Yeah, like. yeah. I mean, with pen and pa paper, you can draw the impulse response <laughs> if, well, if you're patient. For, for a lot of people, never listening to it is, that's how they mix records, too. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that works great, doesn't it? That really works great. Yeah. So I, there, there is a question coming in from uh, the one of the two people who's watching who's not related to us. Um, and they want to know, they want to know which, whether delay or pitch shifting is more tolerant of comb filtering. So they're sort of asking, I think they're asking. You know what? We didn't talk about, about pitch shifting and we should. And there's uh, Tony and, you know, pitch shifting and Tony. So, right there. so I mentioned this on your panel, Tony, is, is in the, in the earliest version. And I guess it had to be the 910, which was like that two digit, uh, display. This is so so we go in between zero and one and try to find that sweet spot to do roads on the right and a little bit of pitch shift on the left and it just made this giant sound. And I think I'm pretty sure, and I'm going to get into trouble with this and, and my pals will correct me. I'm pretty sure I was one of the first ones to do that, is to really do a hard pitch shift just to get that great spread, that swimmy, beautiful spread. But that's decorrelation big time. Absolutely. Because it's random. Things things are uh, shifting around randomly. Yeah. And so yeah. therefore, the, amount. therefore the comb filter can't sit and resonate, right? So you've randomized the delays over right. time a little right. bit. Right. So the comb filter, you you less less tune it and you more just let it wander. And the other thing that, that we should just talk about for a second is a lot of effects that we use have to happen in a real space, have to happen in a room uh, for us really to get a sense of what's going on. And, and one of the challenges is that that can't work with earbuds or earphones, that, that that thing that happens in a room on speakers, which is where we all came from, really. I didn't listen on earphones a lot when mixing back then until I went to Europe. But that thing that happened in the real room, and what you were saying before, Tony, about sounds mixing in air, things mixing in air and doing things in air. To be sensitive to that um, uh, was an important step and something that we learned we had to replicate when we went to earphones and earbuds. Does that make any sense? Probably not. So we're down to one listener outside of us. <laughs> So now you can talk about the uh, super secret patentable idea or uh, no, I'm going to wait. Oh, or, um, so I just want to be sure that this is what you're saying that for when you went to five, one, you would spread out delays of different times and add reverb for decorrelation. And you think this philosophy should work for height as well for immersive. I know it does. From what I've heard, there's some things that you can do that are the, 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 just direct from our experience in, in five, one. And, and, but they all come back to listening. What happens when we try to, to do a pan? You know, the, the first thing that happened when an artist got in the studio with five one is, okay, I, I, I wanna hear this go in circles around me. What a pain in the ass, because nothing had less payoff than a sword spinning around your head. It didn't make any sense. Or, you and know, if you're ways, in the Southern hemisphere, it goes the other way. He goes the other way. Look in the toilet. If you're Bart, just look in the toilet. So the um, the thing is 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 to really understand what you can do in terms of authenticity. And this thing only works if you're on a merry-go-round, you know, and and somebody's yelling at you from over there, and that goes around and around. It just a, it 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 doesn't work. But now, where now, I started now, now, is, now, I'm, now I'm hearing circus music in my head because you mentioned merry-go-round. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but, but what we were talking about is what we can take from 5.1 and move into height. And one of the things is the idea of panning from low to high. high. Low to high has not so much payoff. You know, when we pan from left to right, remember the early command stereo things, mm -hmm. shit panning all over mm -hmm. the place. Uh, that that was pretty nauseating, uh, but but the effect was there. You could hear it. this thing panning something low to high do, doesn't even doesn't even bend the needle, doesn't doesn't move the meter. Mm -hmm. So the things that do work is having to me so far in the mixes I've seen is having individual 
musically to musically to correlated events in, in 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 a sense that they're just odd effects that kind of happen over there. Maybe it's a percussion, certain percussion timbre that that suddenly comes from there. So you have a timbali go gak 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 gak. So it's in a fixed gak. position. It's always going to come from there. It's, it's fixed. Well, well, or if it comes from somewhere else, it's part of a groove, and mm -hmm. so you're anticipating a groove. And mm -hmm. it's coming gak 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 and gak 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 gak. Yeah, yeah, I can get that. Effect. Yep, yeah. is discovering that, and it's something that can repeat and be part of the music, and that's important because rock and roll is all about repeating. You can say that again. Rock and roll is here to again. stay. It will never die. Department of Redundancy Department all over again, huh, guys? Fireside Theater. So you're talking about composing for the space and using it that way or, or generating spatial counterpoint where they're and, playing off each other. And this is what um, uh, Bon Iver, what uh, 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 Justin Vernon does so very well is mm. composing for the stereo space in, in a way that is so brilliant. I can, can't wait for him to compose for a multi-dimensional space. I mean- I've got, I mean, I've got a naive, naive question, George. Sure. This is really probably a very stupid question. And then my phone is ringing. God Jeez. calling. <laughs> so th the question is, do you do a separate mix for people who are going to listen in headphones as opposed to someone who's going to listen in a 5.2 or an Atmos room? Well, right now, the, the bulk of the work is not creating for immersive bulk of the work is remixing for immersive so we're remixing for immersive right are we mixing for headphones it's again from nico bolus's initial experiments it's almost impossible mm -hmm. if you mix on headphones with the headphone algorithm and then listen on your 714 or anything else it's just like that thing that i can't say Right, but but it's the, op the opposite things. though, you know, you have a mix for seven point one, and you're listening to that in headphones. Okay, and there, I'm just hearing that timbral thing that I was talking yep, about before. Yeah, right. Where right. where because they're going to fall together. Thought, and, yep, yep. I thought had I had really anchored mm -hmm. the sound of this thing. It's a mm -hmm. chorus. Say it's a chorus. Say mm -hmm. you finally got the 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 chorus into the bridge, and it it, it grows, and you're going to move the chorus, and break it out with delays so it happens top and bottom that comes back wrong. It comes back out of balance. Yeah. It comes back out of level balance and timbral balance. Now, let me take that back. It wasn't a naive question. It was a stupid question. No, no, it was a good question. A There's good no question. such thing as a stupid question. It's just stupid answers. No, no, I, I'll, I'll okay. take care of that part. I'll give you all the stupid answers you need. Now, look, personally, I think everyone's entitled to my opinion. <laughs> I got to remember that. That's pretty good. That's pretty George, good. Can you elaborate on, on headphone listening versus loudspeaker listening? It's, this is another question from the other person who's watching. Well, well, this is important because I do both and I do both for this reason is that when I'm, I'm moving between studios that I need a standard reference that I can move from here to Japan, to Singapore, to London, to uh, Berkeley and Valencia, to Abu Dhabi, to anywhere, I need a standard reference. So I, I carry, I, I don't mind mentioning because it it's a great headphone, these Odyssey uh, headphones. And they're two uh, planar speakers sitting on off the side of your ear and they're, 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 um, they're a, a standard reference in my life because I know how they relate to speakers, how they relate to my favorite uh, studio speakers, which are currently Genelec, this new series called the Onesies. Uh, that's a really good speaker, but you'll notice I've got, I've got my old Tannoys here because I couldn't bring any other speakers from Montreal. So I had to march these out and they really feel good. Um, so yeah. I can relate a certain number of speakers to this headphone and vice versa. I, I don't have a low octave and I have to get the low octave somewhere else, uh, than headphones. And, and what really, else, what else do you not trust in headphones? So you mentioned the lower octave. 
also the in-head localization? Are there other watch outs of things to ignore in headphones? You don't want to get carried away with headphones. Uh, if you do your whole mix on headphones without going to speakers, you'll invariably have something that you've gotten wrong. Because all, all of us know that thing that happens when you mix too long is you lose your reference. You lose your, your where, where, you, where you started with this. And um, I, I think I'd, I'll go to any speaker just to hear what happens when music hits a room. And I, I mentioned this before, Alex, where in 5.1, I learned a lot from getting a mix in 5.1 and then going, you know, we were in Pete Wozner's studio out here, walking out into the studio through the control room door, leave the control room door open, listen to the mix in the studio, you know, through, through the door. Uh, or even more effective was going outside. He had a patio door going out to his, his lawn on the side is leaving the doors open and listening to a mix outside and listening to the balance. Do I have, to, is the vocal in mm -hmm. power wise speaking? Mm -hmm. Is it in a good place? Is it a good balance? I'm not losing the vocal, am I? Because nothing will lose a record faster than with an artist and losing the vocal. So, uh, so mainly that's a check on balance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cause headphones, I mean, you, you often just get carried away with something that, Sounds so dramatic and impressive. And you listen to it in speakers and oh, fuck, the band yeah. has gone tiny, you know, and that doesn't work. That doesn't work. So how are we going to get in a pitch for Crush Station here? Tony doesn't like it when we promote even tied products, but we it, should do that. It's not really necessary. Well, here's the thing that's necessary is, is, this idea that you have to get saturated sounds out of an AC30, you don't. And and in fact, if you could if you could make adjustment later with a really good processor, you know, you you have a bigger palette. Yeah. Well, signal processing is finally getting good at, at some of these nonlinear effects. So it's well, it's taken a while. It's it's, it's not, taken it's not a while. Clear. It's taken a while. It's it's not clear. I mean, they are a lot nonlinear. And, and that's why I bring up, you know, the sound of music mixing in a room, especially if players are moving around a little bit and playing very, very loud. Well, that's you the know, other it, thing is you, know, is it, you want to, you it, want to the hear way, The way clipping happens, you know, even times plugins don't, don't hard clip. And, you know, I mean, we're very shouldn't. careful not to, not nowhere within the algorithm. I mean, that's. That's probably why our stuff sounds better. It's a good thing no one's listening to this and giving you so, so the other it. thing, the other thing is that idea of you can't really tell how hard it rocks until you listen with a little bit of level. Ed Cherny sure. used to used to say, Oh, George, you gotta fill the speakers. You gotta <laughs> fill the speakers. And he's right. You know, you had to you had to have that that awesomeness of hearing hearing a big playback. Uh, Nico carried that to an extreme, and that's a whole nother story. And he's he's gotten away from that, but uh, but you got to fill the speakers. You're not going to get that on headphones. You 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 don't get that same experience. And do you think you would dare to take that philosophy to immersive? Would Air, would Air Cherney ask us to fill even the height channels? And you'll recall that mm -hmm. I made this Impressive. point when you and I were talking about what we were, what we were going to say here is it has to rock in immersive, and it's. So far, it's been really That's hard tough. to make it rock and immersive. That's tough. And the way I do it, and, and I think it's a good idea, and I'm not saying it's about me or my ideas, because God knows it's not, is to get the original artist's original stereo mix, which is known to have rocked at some point in the past, and, and to get used to that thing, get used to the, especially the kick in the bass, if you're doing anything that's, that's uh, hip hop related or modern related get the kick in the bass right get that feel get that thing but if you're rocking because of that kick because of that kick in the bass coming from a particular place in space and suddenly the kick in the bass happens from somewhere else you've just stopped rocking Where are you and, gonna and so have here's an what you, and so here's absolutely what you have to do you have to move it see if it works it doesn't work tell yourself self i've just fucked up i'll move it back right, right. so i'll i'll try something else else but right. that's that's the experiment is is to maintain the sense that sense of urgency that sense of edge and that sense of punch 
because it really has nothing to do with what's happening up top. The no, fucking fluby does. That becomes a distraction. It becomes an interesting expansion on your basic premise, if, if you will. Uh, it's something to be added to, but not something to depend on. You're not going to get it to rock from, you know, that elevation over there. That doesn't rock. That's something else. That's that's uh, the fight or flight uh, uh, impetus. That, that's the hawk coming in to grab you by that's the right. neck. That's right. That's a different thing. So even, even with the word immersive, you're saying, are you saying that we should really think of facing forward, facing front, facing a band. Not that it has to be realistic. It can be a contrivance, but we still want to look forward for important events. It depends on your assumption. Uh, certainly in headphones, you know, I don't think any of us have thought of putting everything out of face so it feels like it comes from the back, but maybe maybe it's been tried. But in, in, uh, in, in pop music, and I think in a lot of classical, not, not in electronic or any of these genres, the weird genres, but it wants the presentation is in the front. And by the way, in that sense, Alex, I don't think you mind if the lead vocal moves with your head turning and you're on the subway. Well, you wouldn't be on the subway these days, but uh, I don't think it's a problem. I think that's the presentation is lead vocal anchored in the center and by the way a kick and a fucking snare right behind that doesn't hurt mm -hmm. immersive, immersive means you're surrounded by sound but it doesn't mean the sound is coming to you from the back yeah you know the presentation is coming from the front but you're immersed yeah. because there's yeah. energy all around and that energy and a great sounding hall is very pleasant and and helps you know and helps you enjoy it and helps you feel it but Putting, you know, but you, you're not going to have a drummer set up behind you or the tuba set. No, not, not really. Unless you're in the marching band. What other questions do we have? Do we have any questions, James? Well, we're, we're in fact, out of time. We've, we've exceeded oh, our no. hour. So this is the point where we should sum up with a really philosophical epiphany from each of you. No pressure. <laughs> uh, let's, not, let's, let's not do this again. Well, I've got a couple of ideas. I've got a couple of ideas that I'm going to talk to Tony about, and we're going to see if, if before we die, we can come up with one more great idea. George, Just I'm trying. Tony. I'm trying to get as as much done and doing it as well as possible in whatever time I've got left. Now, I feel that. the same way, and I'm not stopping. And I notice you aren't either. No. So, uh, epiphany. Epiphany is music is in good shape because it's democratic. And the robber barons of the record industry have, for the most part, been challenged, if not have been uh, set back. Uh, I think there's epiphany that's happened to all of us is that records are not as important as they used to be. Anything is, is getting uh, the audience's attention more quickly and more thoroughly than music. I think sports or video games, although there's some music and video games. And, and that keeps me that keeps me going trying to make better music because somewhere along the line we we started making cookie cutter music especially here in Nashville and uh, I think we're breaking out of that again especially here in Nashville is that an epiphany does that count and, and the, uh, yeah that yeah and do you think this uh, the fact that we're sequestered and, and this this pandemic is having people think about, how they're playing differently or practicing more or writing more? I haven't seen that yet, Tony, but that is a really good question. I know my friend Kyle Lenning has just done a personal at-home record with some of his favorite musicians, and it's one of the best things I've ever heard. Just cool, cool playing. and yeah. Yeah, Just personally, I, I've been playing a lot more. You know, I, I haven't been commuting. I used to commute. I haven't been to even tied in months. And so uh, I use those hours to, to play. Yeah. I still play poorly, but I'm enjoying it more. Mm -hmm. well, so we humans are going to get through this and we're going to keep making music. We're going to keep making music okay. for well, sure. And some we're of social being... animals and the, the music's yeah. at the heart of it. You know, I mean, I, you know, I guess people have pointed this out, but early languages were probably sung because it's easier to remember. You know, all of us, if you go to a concert, and you're singing along, you'll remember lyrics you can never, and that, that goes for a religion, you know, church or shul or wherever you go. 
if you're with a group of humans um, singing the same song, you're going to remember lyrics you couldn't. And, and we also have to remember that in certain languages, in particular Chinese, a certain vowel intoned a certain oh, it's still way. It's still there, right? Changes the word. But it's yeah. four different words, yep. all depending on how yep. it's yep. intonated. Yep. Now, they think Greek was sung, and it makes sense, because before writing, if we were to communicate information from generation to generation, um, yes. that, had, that had to happen by singing, probably, because yeah. it, it sticks better than just a spoken word. It had to so be memorized. It yeah. had to be memorized. An important point. And when you sing, more parts of your brain are getting involved and triggering. And so, you know, it you seems pretty obvious that uh, one of the reasons we got at, we've gotten as far as social animals as we have is because we have this shared experience. There are very few people who don't react to music. And, and yet there's some. When we moved down here, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Backwards, you know, we had a, a farmer friend, you know, who when as asked what I did, I said, well, I've done this and this. And this you, know, you know, I've never cared too much for music. <laughs> what are you going to say to that? Well, and I think, you can say that you have children. When that ch child was first born, did you hum to them? Did you sing I, to them? I, and I, I bet they did. And I, I bet they did. I bet his wife did. I bet he didn't. So Alex, Alex, what's your epiphany? Oh, I'm just getting epiphanies from each of you. <laughs> That's cheating. I'm, That's I'm moderating <laughs> epiphanies. I don't buy that. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for wasting an hour and 15 minutes of your lives that you're never getting back. Speaking with you and George is, is a rare pleasure. This is and the opposite of a waste of my life. I, I don't get to talk to you guys too often. So, Tony, you know, you've, you've proven yourself absolutely essential to the conversation. And I so appreciate your spending the time. Oh, and uh, no, no. we'll talk. George, we'll you, know, you, know, you, know, you, know, you know that I'm a fan of so much of, the, of your work. So and I, I'm on, honored to be here. As am I. So well, actually, Alex, I'm, I, I, but, but frankly, I'm honored to be anywhere. <laughs> you know you're happy you're happy not to be room temperature exactly and all on right. that note all right okay, alex guys. thanks for thanks, everybody thanks, thanks for forcing well. me to do this take care thanks james Talk <laughs> thank to you sir. james be cool james I, want numbers. I need numbers numbers <laughs>